Can anyone tell me before we get started, what's the name of the series that we've been in here? I just want to check y'all real quick. Hezekiah's heart. Let's say it together. Hezekiah's heart. Say this with me. A Hezekiah heart. Say this with me. Lord, give me a Hezekiah heart. And the reason this is our series title, and you all know, uh, is because we've been focusing on a subject uh, that I pray that by this point, and I'm intentionally not looking you in your eyes right now, because I don't want any of you lying to me through your eyeballs, uh, but I'm praying that at this point that uh, the, the, the subject matter of this series, which is how true or real revival happens, has begun to, to, to be just more than a subject matter in your life uh, as of late, but I pray that it's become more of a spiritual matter than a subject matter for you. And I pray that true and real revival has sprung up or at least begun or initiated somewhere in your life and in your world over these last two months. And if that has not started yet, then I bind everything that has been stopping it by the name of Jesus, by the power of his blood, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that I walk in. Father, I pray that you just knock back any kind of barricade that may have been prohibiting anyone in this house from being able to fully engage with your, thus saith the Lord, to this house at this hour. Father, I ask you to speak to us, and I ask you more importantly to do in these homes. Father, if there's anyone in this house that's left, that revival has not been initiated. Father, start it today. Begin it today. And that's my prayer. And that's my hope for you in Second Chronicles chapter number 30. If you haven't found it by now, then give up, quit, look at your neighbor's Bible, or look on the screen. Um, I want us to read for the sake of time. And today we're, we're going to possibly wrap up this series unless the Holy Spirit does uh, says otherwise. And I, I want to entitle this, this sermon today, is, is, is everyone ready for this? Uh, I want to entitle this sermon today, It's Open Door Season. Everyone say that with me. It's Open Door Season. Say, say it again. Just shout it. It's Open Door Season. Uh, uh, okay, okay. And, and, and I want to subtitle this message. I want to add a question to it. And, and, and y'all know how I am about this stuff. Uh, because you ought to be getting something out of these titles and stuff. Uh, and so let's say this together. It's open door season. Everyone says that. And then I need you to look at your neighbor and ask them, how bad do you want it? Ask them, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? And then if, if, if we were going to give this a, a title for scholarship purposes or subject matter, then I would entitle this the power of exercised authority to give it some subject matter. The power of exercised authority authority. Look at your neighbor and ask them, how bad do you want it? And here in Second Chronicles chapter number 30, and most of you in this place are somewhat current with where we are here in time in our text. And we're coming off Second Chronicles chapter number 29. And in chapter 29, we know that the temple has been set in order after generations of being laid not desolate, but laid to waste, laid to trash, and left out of order, uh, and left broken down and shut up for generations. Now suddenly, the people of Judah find their temple in order, because Hezekiah has called them in, 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 in order, the Levites and the priests. He's called the Levites and the priests together to set the temple back in order, but there was a reason, and, and we saw this in Second Chronicles chapter 29. If you've been here, we see that the reason is uh, Hezekiah gave, gave, gave us insight to the inkling and the desire of his heart, which is he wants to see God turn things around. Hezekiah wants to see God turn things around. Hezekiah is smart enough to know that things are not necessarily the way that they ought to be. How many of you know that you ain't got to know everything that is going to be in order to know that things are not everything that they're supposed to be?
to be. And sometimes just the realization that everything ain't the way it's supposed to be is supposed to be enough to initiate us to get up and begin to do something about it. Can somebody say amen? So Hezekiah has done something about it. And as we see them experience what they would call success and what we would call success too at the end of chapter 29, Brother Alfonso, which is the people celebrated at the end of chapter 29 for what the Lord had done, for what God had done and how he had brought about it so quickly. And, and really, God hadn't done anything except show up. They did everything else. They knew, though, that things are now the way that they're supposed to be. They felt it, and they celebrated it. In verse 4 of chapter 30 now, they were called up. The plan for keeping the Passover, because now Hezekiah felt that things in order. It's time to celebrate the festival of the Passover. And now the keeping of the Passover seemed right to the king and all the people. And verse 5 says, So they sent a proclamation throughout all of Israel, from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north. They covered the land, inviting everyone to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people had not been celebrating it in great numbers as required in the law. And at the king's command, the runners were sent throughout the land of Israel and Judah. And they carried letters that said, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he will return to the few of us who have survived the conquest of the Assyrian kings. Don't be like your ancestors and relatives who abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Verse 8 says, don't be stubborn. Verse 9 says, listen, if you return to the Lord, your relatives and your children will be treated mercifully by their captors. Things are going to be able to begin to turn around is what he's saying. And they will be able to return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. Hezekiah is letting them know, if you will accept this invitation right here, then I guarantee you that you're going to begin to see things turn around in your life. You're going to begin to see revival happen. If you return to him, he will not continue to turn his face from you. And these runners, they went from town to town. They went throughout Ephraim and Manasseh. They went as far as the territory of Zebulun. But most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. However, some of the people from Asher, from Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. At the same time, God's hand was on the people in the land of Judah, giving them all one heart to obey the orders of the king and his officials who were following the word of the Lord. I want you to look at the end of this chapter in verse number 27. tells us that the priests and the Levites stood and they blessed the people, and God heard their prayer from his holy dwelling in heaven. Then the priest and Levites stood and blessed the people, and God heard their prayer from his holy dwelling in heaven. Again, this message today will be entitled, It's Open Door Season. Everyone say that with me. It's Open Door Season. And I want you to ask your neighbor, how bad do you want it? Ask your neighbor, how bad do you want it? Set that Bible down. Lord, I thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you that you're here to talk to us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God praise one more time for this passage of scripture. You may have your seat. Let's say it again. How bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? Ask somebody, how bad do you want it? And again, we're speaking of Hezekiah. And we have been focused on this subject, this thought, that's much more than a thought of how true revival happens. And of course, this series was birthed, Travis, because the Lord gave this series to me. And the Lord gave this series to me at a time that I didn't feel it was time to share with this church. And I thought to myself as the Lord began to show this series to me in the way that he began to show it to me, I started realizing, man, this is a powerful series. <laughs> I started thinking to myself, there's some good stuff in here. 
But then I thought to myself, and I'm not just talking. Y'all know me. I'm going somewhere with this little talk of mine here. I started thinking to myself, well, Pastor Norris, I'm going to do this series here when I feel the time is right to do it. This is what I thought to myself. I thought to myself, I'm going to do this series, Brad and my brother. I'm getting to you at a specific and planned on part of this service. And I want to tell you, because real revival is happening in my life, my brother is sitting in this audience today unexpectedly. But let's go ahead and make some noise and honor the man of God because he is a man of God. Preacher, prophet, apostle, pastor, Bradley Knight. Come on, church. I want you to make some noise. Some of y'all know who he is already. I'll tell some of y'all later who he is, but who he is is Bradley Knight. And, and that's really all, all that counts and matters uh, because he's a powerhouse of a man. And I'm just so happy that he's here. But, you know, uh, I was even sharing this with, with, with Brad how this series came about, Pastor Norris. And then one day, for the reason I'm going to preach this word here today, the Lord said, hey, it's time for you to go ahead and turn to Second Chronicles chapter 29. And I said, Lord, what do you mean it's time? And the Lord kind of asked me, well, what would make it not time? The Lord kind of responded to me like, well, what would make you think that it's not time to bring this word? And so I told the Lord, well, I could tell you why, because it's the middle of the summer, number one, uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, God is when church attendance usually goes down. Lord, you know this as well as I know this. God, you taught me this through experience because of my calling that during the summer is not the time to try to really start some kind of something that you think is going to build anything. If I can just say it that general enough, it's not the time to try to initiate that kind of thing in your house. And the Lord started arguing with me even more, Brother Alfonso. And the Lord began to show me what I believe that the Lord is going to show some of you today, that the reason I needed to get off and running in this word right here, Minister Haven, it, it, is not so much about y'all as it was about me. Because the Lord knew that once he got me running off in this, this word, that he was going to have to inevitably, Brother Jones, he was going to have to deal with me and do some work through me concerning some certain things that, that in reality I could have never foreseen. I could have never foreseen. I could have never foreseen that two weeks ago that I'd get this little voice memo drop on my phone and the little voice memo is this this unique particular special character named bishop greg gill who you just seen on the screen dropping me a little voice memo in his canadian and you know canadian people talk funny they don't they sound they talk english different and in his funny voice and with his unique self he says pastor d I know I hadn't had any prophetic words for you in a long time, and it wasn't no church service, Elder Parlor. This was like a Friday afternoon, and nothing was going on, and I could hear him eating in the background or something, and I could hear stuff going on, but this is how you know a prophet's a prophet. And he said, but the Lord just spoke to me right now, and he said, ooh, sha, hey, hey, I'm sorry, <laughs> speaking in tongues. And he said, the, the Lord told me that, that such and such kind of people are going to start showing up in your life. And, and this man goes into two and a half minute detailed prophetic word. And I, and I hang up the phone with him. And it wasn't in about four hours, Dory, that the Lord starts confirming that the word that this man is speaking to me. And, and, and does that happen all the way until I'm, I'm looking at my brother who, who is here by, by sincerely the divine prophetic word of the Lord? Can I, can I share? Can I share? Can I share with, with you what I mean? Friday, Friday, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm sitting with my daughter and, and, and I start talking about my brother. I, I ain't going to take you into the whole story. And I hadn't talked about my brother in years because of what I told my daughter when she asked. She said, how long has it been since, since, since you talked to him? And I said, it, it's been really, I think, just almost 12 years now. Can you believe that? And the mayor said, I can't believe it's, it's been that long. And we reminisced and told stories and my heart burned. And, and, and this ain't happening years, Marie. And, 
and, and, and that night I, I go to bed and, and I wake up the next morning and I got all these messages on my phone from, from him and his wife in essence saying all, all, all afternoon and all evening yesterday Brad kept talking about I, I have to get to San Antonio right now to see my brother and, and I had no idea the prophetic vein that he's walking in right now and so when he showed up to say I'm here because we're supposed to be building the kingdom of God together man a whole lot more than that and I, and I showed up because the Lord told me to show up the Lord told me to just stand at your front door and say what do we have to do to build the kingdom I mean that's one of a million of a million testimonies myself I could give you from just two weeks brother Linwood that I know had I not said yes Lord I'll start this series right here it wouldn't have happened it wouldn't have happened the Lord began to do things in my life and it led me to this word that I knew I'd come to eventually. Because a few weeks ago, as we got started in this word and this message, we began by realizing and recognizing that this entire transformation that we see taking place in the nation of Judah, this turnaround, if you will, this, 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 this revival, this revolution, if you will, this happens and we recognize because Hezekiah decided that this needs to happen. This, this needs to happen. If you look at Second Chronicles chapter number 29, the scripture tells us that Hezekiah started his, his, his reign when he's 25 years old. And verse 3 tells us that in the very first month of the first year, of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and he repaired them. I want to read it to you one more time in 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 3. In the very first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and he repaired them. Oh, I was telling Minister Haven up here yesterday, standing on this stage, I had to give him just a drop of what I knew the Lord was sharing with me. And I shared with him what I'm about to drop on you. And we're going to get here. We're going to get off and run in here. And I asked Minister Haven, I said, do you know why Hezekiah reopened those doors and repaired them, Minister Haven? Do you know one of the reasons, one of the very main reasons that Hezekiah opened them doors, Elder Carlos, and repaired them? Do you know why he did that? And Minister Abin, you know, of course, could have come up with some, with some logical, educated responses, but he asked why, and I obligated him the answer. And the answer really was because he could, Linwood, because he could. Hezekiah opened the doors and repaired them because Hezekiah was King Hezekiah. Oh, let me put it in perspective for you. Not any old person just walking around Jerusalem during that time, Travis, could have just made a decision. You know what? I don't like that the doors are unrepaired. I don't like that there's no temple life. I don't like that, 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 that our forefathers have desecrated the temple. The fact of the matter is not any old person could have repaired the doors, but Hezekiah could, well, simply because Hezekiah just so happened to be King Hezekiah. And because Hezekiah was King Hezekiah, Vanessa and, and, and Theo, Hezekiah, because he was King Hezekiah, made a decision one day that, you know what? I want to reopen the doors and I want to repair them. And you know what he did? He reopened the doors and he repaired them. Why did he do it? Because he could. And when the Lord started sharing this with me a few weeks ago, oh, and I had a bite on my tongue, Stephanie, all week, uh, all month this month to not preach this word sooner because I've been carrying around this revelation that really the main reason that Hezekiah did what he did is because he could do what he did. And I started getting mad at the devil because I started thinking about all the believers that don't deal with the things in their life that they can deal with because they don't realize that they can deal with it. They have the authority to walk in the capacity they need.
need a walk-in to deal with some of the things that they want to see dealt with in their life. And I came to help you unlock your authority in this place today and know that you have every right and every power and every bit of authority to begin to deal with things today if that's the decision that you make. <clears throat> y'all gonna make me preach hard today, I can tell it. I'm gonna preach it to y'all 10 people. I'm gonna preach to y'all 10 people because, because that's how this series came about. Because I began to realize that Hezekiah did it because he could do it. Hezekiah did it because he didn't have to wait on nobody. Well, let's take it, let, let's take it where it needs to go. Because the fact of the matter is, he did have to wait on somebody for a minute. And the fact of the matter is, it was at 25 that he became king. Mm -hmm. At 25, he's given the power limb wood to go in there and repair them doors. Why? Because at 25, he became king. I bring this up because some in the 25 years, if he come first rattle out the box, Pastor CJ, as my granddaddy used to say, first thing, first rattle out the box, here he comes first month, first year of his reign, repairing doors. Then that means that something's been eating at him. Uh huh. That means he's been thinking, boy, as soon as I ever come across the deck. If somebody puts that crown on my head, puts that scepter in my hand, puts that authority, sign, signs my name or whatever piece of paper needs to be signed, I'm telling you right now, the day that that happens, some of y'all know that because that's how you talk about your boss right here. <laughs> I'm playing, I'm messing with you. The day, but, that, but that's what's happening with Hezekiah. The day that I become king, and we know this because that's exactly what he did. And I realize that many believers do not walk in their authority because they don't realize that they can walk in their authority. I came to remind every one of you in this place today that revival can start in your life and in your world today if you just decide, you know what? Today, I'm gonna see revival happen in my life and in my world. You have the authority, you have the power to say revival is starting in my home, it's starting in my life, it's starting in my children today. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna give you about five seconds to go ahead and just say, you know what, God, I'm gonna give you praise right now because I know that revival is about to happen or you might be there now when I say revival we define this we already defined this because as you traverse our your way through chapters 29 30 and 31 you begin to see these things happen that I don't have time to reference every verse of scripture but of course we see that you know, the house is, is set in, in, in order. Um, we, we see that the landscape of people's spiritual life is changing without anyone having to tell them to do it. People start tearing down idols on their own. People start tearing down uh, statues on their own. No, Hezekiah is not even telling them to do it. They're just running out, Brad, and they're doing it on their own because of what has been instigated in them. We see that everything that Hezekiah does, the Lord blesses it and he has success. And so we know that when there's revival, then that means there's an open heaven over us. And I'm believing that these things are going to happen for you and your family. Can somebody say amen? This is my word to you. This is my word over your home. This is my word over this house and my house. When revival happens, or, or I want to remind remind you that revival will happen around us first when revival happens in us. And what's the first thing that Hezekiah dealt with? Of course, he dealt with the doors. We know this. Can somebody say amen? amen. Look at somebody and ask them, how bad do you want it? Ask them that question. How bad do you want it? Again, the subject matter is the power of exercise authority. Um, I, I told my brother this this morning, this this quote that I wrote down, um, that authority 
is an authenticator. Authority is an authenticator. Stay with me here. Authority will show whether you are authentic or not is what that means. And when I say authority is the authenticator, it will show whether you are authentic or not. Hezekiah, he knew, Brother Jesse, what he needed to do. He knew this because he had this epiphany that some of us have in here today, some of us don't. That first of all, although I am in authority here, which he exercised, there's this epiphany we see at work, this realization that he's carrying that his authority is limited. And I say this because there's an admission here in 2 Chronicles chapter number 29, if you're looking at it from the correct perspective, that there are conditions within this land and within this body of people that have come upon us that I do not have the power to change myself. I need you to hear me, church, in this hour. We're hear me, hear me, hear me. He realized that my capacity is limited here. Let me say it like this. Here's the admission. Everything is like this right here because God has allowed it to be. Not because I did. Because our forefathers stopped recognizing him for who he was. Are, are you with me right now? And so when Ezekiah began to realize that although I have a certain aspect and realm of authority because I'm king, you have to see that there's some wisdom in Hezekiah. And understanding that in me being king all by myself, that doesn't mean that I can end the Assyrian rule here. Just because I'm king all by myself, it doesn't mean that I can change the greater condition of everything, but he was smart enough to know that my authority resides under the auspices of the one that has the authority to change those conditions. Are, are you with me right now? Are you with me? So this is faith ultimately at work. Ultimate faith, great faith is not realizing that God is God. And then sitting back and saying, God, I know that you are the very God that you proclaim yourself to be. And that's why I'm so frustrated with you, God. Because God, you're not doing everything that I would expect for you to do. Wow. At the same time, God's looking at us generation after generation going, well, you're not doing anything that I've been expecting you to do in order for me to come and respond the way that heaven was designed to respond to earth. Because let me tell you something, God just does not respond any old way we want him to. As my daddy used to say, God is not a heavenly bellhop. Brad, there are conditions that we can create here. There are atmospheres we can create right here in the earth that God cannot help but respond to. And I'm just like Cornelius' prayer came up as a sweet incense onto God because Cornelius just decided even though I don't know how to do it the right way I'm going to do it the pure way I'm going to do it the best way I know how and God allowed heaven to meet earth right there at that point in time and I know that there are people in this hour that are going to begin to do the things for God to respond because we realize we realize that it's not about us pointing out the condition around us to him. It's, a, it's realizing, are we able to point at ourselves and deal with the things that God has given us to deal with? And that's the power of Hezekiah, is that although I realize that we are in captivity right now, there are still some things that I do have the power to do. 
There are still some things that I do have the power to manage and control. This is the dilemma for too many believers in this hour. We get discouraged and we don't handle ourselves, our life, our personal life, our attitude, whatever it may be, our own spirit, our own atmospheres, the way that we ought to, excused on the basis of, well, God has not given us the right conditions to lead back to why I didn't start this series originally to begin with. Because I thought to myself, God, when I feel like it's revival around me. God, when I see enough prophets around the country starting to pop off and have revival, then I know it's time to turn to Second Chronicles chapter number 29. Lord, when I see your spirit fall in a certain kind of way on a Sunday morning in place for life, then I'm going to know it's time to start this series on how true revival happens. And then the Lord waited because the Lord gave me this series like a year ago. I'm serious. Last October is when I started reading this. And all of a sudden, right here at the low point of the year, when well, summertime come on, and all my leaders are like, I'm going on vacation, doing all this stuff, and you know, we, you know, it's summertime. But the Lord's like, bring that bad boy out right now. Start, start preaching revival. I said, God, you've got to be kidding me. And I started doing it anyway. And then the Lord began this kind of work in me right here. I began to see, oh, the Lord was just simply initiating a revival in me that I knew I could initiate, but I thought I had to wait on everybody else. And the Lord had to remind me, you ain't got to wait on nobody. You ain't got to wait. You ain't got to wait. You ain't got to wait. And this ain't no offense to anybody but a family member, a staff member, a musician, a camera director. You ain't got to wait on a brother, a sister. You ain't got to wait on a friend. You ain't got to wait on anyone, Dustin, in order for you to say, you know what, God? Revival's going to start in my life, in my house, and in my church right now because God began to remind me that I set you as the pastor over that house. I set you as the father over your own house and you got a realm of authority to say, you know what? Revival starts now. And so what I did is I started living in revival and I started preaching revival and I started seeing around me that, you know what? In some ways, revival's happening. And I noticed it's happening with the people that you would expect. It's happening with the Levites and the priests. Man, look at Minister Haven. Come up here two Saturdays, I'm up here. And Minister Paul Haven, up here setting this house in order. And I'm like, Lord, I'm getting my truck and cry all the way home. I'm serious, I did. Ask my fiance sitting over there. I got in that truck and I cried all the way home because I thought to myself, man, thank God for a man that says I'm a priest and I'm a Levite. And I'm not a priest and I'm a Levite because the conditions feel right right now. I'm not a priest and I'm a Levite because I'm getting a, a, a certain amount on a check right now. I'm not a priest and a Levite because I'm getting some kind of honor right now. No, I'm a priest and a Levite because this is my house. I helped build this house. And I know that it, he ain't saying all that to me, but he's screaming and at me when I see him up here wrapping up cords and teaching his son the ways of the house of the Lord and how to conduct himself with excellence and standards. And I'm seeing that happen across this house and in little pockets. I'm seeing man the priests and the Levites I'm seeing the Harberts and I'm seeing uh, brother Alfonso and the Hunters I'm, I'm seeing all my leaders really get with it like you would expect you expect priests and Levites to get with it you expect priests and Levites to say okay Pastor D we, we are priests and Levites okay Hezekiah we priests and Levites but 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 we still have, have, have this other part of the story to deal with because just because Pastor CJ you get up and say revival's here. Just because you get up and say that victory's here, ask Gideon. He had 20-some 20, 20 thousand people walk out on him. Walk away from him for one reason or another. You know, you could say it's revival time, like what happened here for Hezekiah. But it ain't going to matter sometimes. And this is what I came to preach about because I want to show you I believe what Hezekiah was trying to show these people, whether they were getting it or not. Now, the end story is that they all get it. 
and the whole land goes into revival. And so I'm going to tell you ahead of time before I get there. We going into revival. What do you mean, Pastor Dustin? Protracted meetings? I don't know. What do you mean, Pastor Dustin? Mass healings? I don't know, probably. Probably so. What do you mean, like lots of people getting saved? Yeah, probably. What do you mean, Pastor Dustin? People getting filled with the Holy Spirit? Walking in confidence? Walking in the power of the Spirit? Yeah, yeah something like that. What do you mean? Pastor Dustin, people getting saved and baptized? Yeah, what do you mean? Generational curses broke off people, people seeing seeing the world in a way that they never even thought that they could see the world. They, is that what you mean, Pastor Dustin? Yeah, yeah that, 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 that's what I mean. I, I, I think, I think, but what I mean when I say revival's gonna happen is I can tell you whatever it is that you think things look like right now, Fast forward six months from now, and I can guarantee you, they ain't going to look the same. It ain't going to feel the same. I guarantee you, you're going to hear some kind of story, some kind of testimony, feel some kind of power, see something you ain't never seen, experience something you ain't never felt before, because I know that's what happened when revival happens. And I can tell you right now, whether you want it or not, just because you happen to be and reside in the land, revival is going to overwhelm you. Because I know that there's at least about three tribal people up in this place that say, I want it bad enough that it don't matter what everybody else says. Are you with me? Are you, are you with me? And that's what happened here. What happens here in our text. And man, I ain't even got, I ain't even really looked at my notes. We ain't even really gotten into this word like I wanted to. I'm going to be, I'm going to be very honest with you. And I can't preach all day. Because I, I have an airplane to catch. They were supposed to leave at 1.15. But, so which means I had to be there at 12.15. But then they texted me and they said, we're running late. The flight's 30 minutes behind. And I said, the Lord really does want to have his way in this place today. I got that text right before I walked out here. So I thought I got a little, little bit of time to work with here. Um, but what happens in our text is exactly what I just said. Hezekiah begins to send out a proclamation here in Second Chronicles chapter 30 that we're celebrating the Passover because we can. And God, in essence, what he's saying, if you read the whole text, God's here. God's in it. God is endorsing it. God's endorsing it. And what we see is most of the people, the, the, the Bible says, they laughed. In other words, they didn't accept their invitation, Dory, for this reason. There's a reason they didn't. They didn't because everything about what they had learned and experienced more importantly up to this point in their life says that there's no reason to celebrate the Passover. There's no reason to celebrate the Passover because we're in captivity. No one's there to celebrate it and do it right anyway. And at this point, they didn't even believe in any kind of God saving them for nothing to begin with. So they don't come to the Passover, but a few respond to Hezekiah's call, yes, a remnant. And what we see at the end of the chapter is God begins to respond to the entirety of a land, Elder Parla, because of these few that decided that, you know what, we're going to respond or we're going to realize, and this is why I said open door season, we're going to realize that there has never been a more, oppor a, a, a more opportune time to respond in spirit and in heart than right now. Yeah. Now, I love the way this happened. In retro, Brad, and I'm about to close up. I'm so happy that the story played out the way that it did. Because in retro, what we see happen is only a few respond. What we see happen is what happens. Yeah. Most of the people say, no, we ain't celebrating this. But a few do. 
And when they begin to celebrate, Dory, you know what happens? The glory of the Lord begins to fall in that place and Jerusalem begins to become reestablished in a sense that it had not been established in generations because of the few. And what it tells us about the story is God don't need everyone's agreement in order to do what he's going to do. All he needs is a few people that will say, I don't care how cynical the rest of the world looks at the hour that we live in. I don't care how brothers and sisters that don't even go to my church talk about what's going on in the church in this hour because I know what God is doing right there in my house and I know that if I can just keep my door open if I can realize that it is open door season then God is inevitably going to respond this is exercising authority because they realize that Hezekiah had declared it's open door season. You see, it's understandable, and you can, you can close, Brother Josiah. You can close. It's understandable, I think, to a degree, to not anticipate great and large revival at certain moments in our life at a great and public scale. That's understandable. From this message, I hope, that you take away that it is never understandable for you to not be the initiator of revival. And again, there's so much. I, I really do have to close. There's, there's, there's so much New Testament scripture I need to get into. Maybe we'll come back to it. Maybe I'll teach on it Wednesday night online. Maybe that's, that'll be the best thing to do. But there's never an excuse, Sister Susan, to not initiate revival and keep the thread of revival or the flame of revival lit in our own home or within our own realm, no matter what's going on around us. And this is what we learned from Hezekiah. And in Hezekiah's doing what he did with all these people is take any excuse that they had away. You know, my prayer here recently, in, in my very close, close relationships know this. My prayer has been, God, take any excuse like, help me. If there's anything in me that could be an excuse for somebody to not be, be initiator of revival in their own home, Father, take them excuses even away from me. And Hezekiah made the moves in his own life and around him to say, you know what? You, you, you have every right and, and more than that, an obligation to walk in a certain authority in your house. You need to walk in authority. You need to walk within the realms of your authority that say, I want revival. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, and again, I'm having to skip over a bunch of notes, but I want you to catch this because I told you that authority is an authenticator. And a lot of people don't walk in authority in their life really because they're fraudulent, you know, and they know that they are. Let me give an example. In Matthew chapter number eight, we see this man run up to Jesus and he tells Jesus, my little girl is sick and dying at home. Y'all know the story. And he says, I need you to send your word. He said, I need you to heal my daughter. And Jesus planned on going with him. Y'all know the story. And the man stopped him. And he said, I know you're busy. I don't need you to come. You could send your word. And he says it like this. He says, I know how that works because I'm a man under authority, right? He says, but I'm also a man in authority. He says, I tell one to go and it goes. And I tell one to come and he comes. And then he gets back into his request. I was telling Brad as we're getting ready for church this morning, I said, man, the Lord showed me and I, I really jumped out of my chair that this man intentionally didn't feel the need to go into the details, Pastor CJ, of how he follows authority. The only details he shared with us is concerning how he exercises authority. Because a person that exercises authority and confidence is a person that you can guarantee that is living their life under authority the right kind of way. Can somebody say amen? And a lot of people won't walk in authority 
because they know inside I, I have been right with my authority. Oh, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Oh, because I'm going to help somebody. Because most preachers would end right there and they leave you hanging. And they tell you, you better get right. <laughs> my dad was discussing a contractual situation this week with these business guys and I was on the call with him and in this contract there was something that happened and, but if this you know if we want to make this move right here build, 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 with this contract then if within this next couple of years such and such happens then, then this and this will be this much money and that and so you know that contract expired and we got to the other side but some, some business dealings and discussions continued along all the way up here until this week and these people trying to negotiate my dad at some complete other kind of price that wasn't in that, that original kind of deal. So my dad, here's why I said all that, because he had to remind them, like, you know, I know it's 2022. He said, but I'm a cowboy. Y'all know that. He told them that. And he said, and there's this thing that I, there's this phrase that, that I grew up with that was even known in the secular business world called good faith. That, that I know it ain't on the con on that contract still right there what we talked about but you know you're really catching me off guard by coming over here because it's a complete change in, in what we had talked about in other words we didn't really have to have a contract for me to be thinking and believing that this way things were going to go if we ever came to that moment in time right there everyone say good faith good faith and this is why I ain't going to leave you hanging because as far as walking in your authority this is what's awesome about God, is that God has given you good faith. In other words, God doesn't expect you to have to have everything around you looking in order for you to begin to understand that you carry the authority that heaven has given you for you be to begin to start walking in authority. Let me give you some practical, practical, re uh, 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 so some, some practical uses of exercising authority and where we feel prohibited, and then we'll close. Some more I shared with Brad this morning. Areas that we won't exercise authority. Some of y'all this week, you had a coworker that needed prayer for something, but instead of walking in authority, knowing that really the answer to that person's problem and what they're going through is they needed me to go lay hands on them and pray for them, I didn't go home. I didn't go over and lay hands on them and pray for them because two years ago we had a conversation we shouldn't have had together or we went and did something that I regret doing with that coworker. That they saw a side of, of my character that I, that I regret and therefore I'm allowing that to prohibit me from walking in my spiritual authority and laying hands on my coworker and being the kingdom of God right there in real time for that person. Can somebody say amen? Some of you won't even straighten your kids up the right way. Can I get an amen? Some of you won't witness. And the kingdom is shut down because we don't exercise authority based on the feeling that we don't have it. And I want to remind you today that you have authority. I don't care where you're at in life right now. I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care. I don't care what happened this week. God will give you good faith that if in your heart today you say, you know what? I need revival to start in my home today. God does not need you to, to be to a certain level to begin to rearrange relationships in your life and saying, I won't have that kind of conversation. I won't do that over there. Is somebody with me? I'm going to lay hands and pray on this person over here. I don't care what nobody thinks about it. I'm going to start tithing today. Even though I haven't tithed, I'm going to sow an offering. I, I mean, there, there are so many ways that we rob ourselves of God's access to us and his response to us because we do not exercise the authority that he's given us to walk in. I want to remind you that this revival started in 2 Chronicles chapter number 29 because Hezekiah opened the doors. And Hezekiah opened the doors because he could. I just want to end a message that I didn't get to preach in total at all by asking you, are you going to open the doors that you can today? Because everyone in this place today, and let's all stand to our feet, you have some set of doors that are under your authority. The word tells us that we are the temple of God. 
You're, you are the only person in control of you. Some of you right now, revival just needs to happen in you. It don't need to happen in nothing. Just, just you. Just you all by yourself. And you got doors right now. But you don't need nobody. You don't need nobody to open for you. As a matter of fact, you're the only one that can. You're the only one that has a right to repair them, to reopen them, to say, God, have your way. God, do what you want to do in my life. As a matter of fact, let's lift every hand in this place. And Father, I don't want to linger here too long, but Holy Spirit, I ask you to allow this word, this manna from heaven. Father, I know this was necessary sustenance for someone in this place today. And I pray that someone go home and I pray that someone begin to walk in spiritual authority in their own life. I pray that someone begin to take authority in their own life. I pray that you give someone the authority to begin to speak their life in faith, to call things that are not as though they are, to begin to set their house, their life in order. And when I say their house, the temple that is them, Father, I pray that you allow people to understand that you have grace with us. Father, you have good faith with us. Father, the first thing you need us to do is to walk in authority to give you an opportunity. Father, when we don't exercise authority, we limit you. Father, when we don't exercise our kingdom authority, we limit the effectiveness of your kingdom around us. And Father, I pray that right now any stronghold, any thought, any obstacle, Father, anything from the psyche to the soul that has prohibited, stopped anyone in this place, Father, from walking in the, the authority that you've given them to walk in in their life, I pray that you set them free right now, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, get a hold of that person right now and set them free in Jesus' name. Shame is gone. Guilt is gone. That's number one. That's first and foremost. Ah, you can't walk like that forever. There's somebody in here. You've been walking like that too long. And the Lord says to come up and lift your head up now today and walk in confidence. Some of you have been, have been carrying things longer than the Lord has. And the Lord says today it's time for you to let go of some things and start walking in the authority of who you are. Some of you husbands today, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, some of your husbands need to know it, it, it ain't there anymore. You're not in that season anymore, that, that, you, are, that you are in a new season. You're a man of God. You have, you have every right that the, that the word of God tells you that you have. You have every bit of authority in your home, over your children, with your wife, in your house, over your life, over their destinies. Uh, I speak right now that every man in this house, oh, Father, I pray right now. I pray the power of your Holy Spirit. Get a hold of every man in this house. Father, let your power get a hold of them. Father, I pray that you shake every man down in this house today before they even woke up. I pray every man walk up to their front door walking differently today. I pray they walk up to their front door knowing that they hold a key that nobody else holds. They hold a key to open things that can't nobody else open and close things that nobody else can close. Walk in your authority over your family, over their future in the name of Jesus. And I bind anything that would try to stop these men from walking in their God-given positions in this hour. Devil, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And men, we set you free to your position in Jesus' name. And I speak the grace of the Holy Spirit with it. Father, I speak your wisdom into every man. As we walk in that authority, Father, I speak your grace and your wisdom. Father, for every single mother in this place, Every single mother, I pray they walk in the authority that you've given them, the same kind of authority over their home as they stay submitted to you. The same with us men, other single folks in this house, the single folks that are in here right now. Some of you have roommates right now. And I want to let you know, even with roommates in, 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 in your in, in your vicinity, in, in them apartments and in them condos and in them houses. I want to tell you right now that you have spiritual authority that you carry with you. And I pray that you know today that when you go home to spaces that you shared, you lease with other people, 
that because you are blood bought and because you belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, there is no spiritual principality that has access to you, that has access to your posterity. As a matter of fact, there are some of you that have been living in fear because you know that you are inevitably associated with things right now that life has tied you down to. And I want to let you know that you have every bit the power that anyone in this place has to call things in your atmosphere and in your home and, and, and tell things the way that they're going to be. Death shall not come die at your door. There ain't going to be nothing crazy happen to you. No harm, no injury in the name of Jesus. Walk in your God-given authority in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Father, I pray for the leadership of this house and the leadership of the church in this hour. Father, for the season, I just pray from this pulpit that I know you're calling the church in this hour too. Father, I pray that you give us the strength, the fortitude, and the wisdom to walk in the authority that you've given us to walk in because I know that this is the only way that your kingdom can be established in this earth. We have to walk in the authority you've given us today. Father, we thank you right now. We thank you it's open door season. Father, we want it bad. We say yes, we want it bad. We want it bad. Father, we're going to show it to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's put our hands together. Let's give God praise one more time. Come on, church. Come on, church. I got to I gotta go talk to our bishop. I don't want anyone to leave this place today without giving, first and foremost, so something. I know some of you are going, well, we brought our tithe, especially our guests. I know, but this is an offering. This is just an opportunity for you to sow. This is not covenant, but this is for you to sow into this house. Amen. Most churches receive tithe and offering at the same time. Maybe we will like that next week. But today we didn't. Today we're taking our offering right now. And I want everyone to sow and to give. Amen. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, do not leave this place without connecting with a brother or sister in this house that you do not know. And the church said, amen. I'm seeing this house come together in a very unique way, in a very special way. Um, and it's because of the relationships that are beginning to form. There are relationships to be had. And some of you are robbing yourself of some very, some very rich relationship in your life right now by simply not making your way across this auditorium after church is over sometimes, or simply not pausing in the lobby to just talk to someone because you know God put you here for a reason and that reason is is right here we know that but some of you don't realize that there are relationships in here that literally can change your life in so many ways and so uh we have to network we got to continue to build relationship in this place amen does everyone have their offering prepared if you do then lift it towards heaven father we thank you for this day father I thank you that you've done what you came to do in this place today Father, I pray that you begin or that you continue what you have already begun, that you continue to usher us in to the new place that I know you're taking us, Father. Father, I thank you that we're certainly in a new season and there's certainly new, there's new relationships coming to this house, God. We know that there's new things that you're doing with us. And Father, we ask you like you did in the book of Second Chronicles in chapter 29, like you did for Hezekiah and those people. Lord, we pray that you do it here quickly. Expedite it. Expedite your work in this house quickly. Father, there are people in this place that need prayers answered. And they need you to do some things for their home, for their family, for their life. God, I pray the same prayer over their home, over their family, and over their life. I pray that you do your work during this season quickly and make it very obvious. Father, we will give you the praise. You know that. We will declare your kingdom in this earth. You know that. Father, we thank you for the privilege and the honor it is to be this church called Place for Life. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Let's give God praise. Y'all pray for me and Apostle, Prophet, Brad. We're about to jump on a plane and we're going to go see my father. Um, we're we're going to talk with him. Um, but keep us in prayer. But I love you. It's, an, it's a new day around here. Amen. Y'all love on each other before you leave. Bring those offerings to the front. We'll see y'all in here on Sunday morning. God bless you. Love y'all.